Welcome to Marrow Masters Season 8, sponsored by Omeris Corporation and Insight. The National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, established in 1992, strives to help patients, caregivers, and families cope with the psychosocial challenges of bone marrow and stem cell transplant from diagnosis through survivorship. Season 8 of our show focuses on clinical trials. We're covering how to find them, what to expect, and how survivors have benefited from them. We also talk to healthcare professionals about how these oncology clinical trials are conducted and monitored safely. Our goal is to answer as many of your questions as possible. Here's your host, Executive Director of the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, Peggy Burkhardt. Hello, everyone. Today, we welcome Mel Mann of Jonesboro, Georgia. Mel is a retired Army major who was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia, which is CML, in 1995. So a clinical trial saved Mel's life more than 20 years ago. Hello, Mel. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So we're going to get right into it, Mel. I'm so excited to have you here to share this story. We'd like to hear about your diagnosis and how you decided to participate in this monumental, life-saving clinical trial. Okay, so what happened was in 1995, I was living up in Michigan and I had back pain and I had fatigue and I went to the doctor and the doctor took some tests, took an MRI and uh, he came back and he told me that I had chronic myeloid leukemia. Yeah, he had to confirm the results and I was living up in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, stationed in the military at a place called the Tank and Automotive Command. And uh, my wife and my daughter were also living with me. My daughter was only five years old at the time. Wow. You know, I went to the doctor and, and he said, I had three years to live. That was the prognosis for chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, CML for short. He also told me that the only possible cure was a bone marrow transplant. And in fact, it wasn't exactly a cure, he said, uh, for a better outcome. He also mentioned that there were very few uh, African Americans on the bone marrow registry. And that was important because your bone marrow determines a lot about you, it determines your hair color, eye color, you know. He usually met someone who's in the same ethnic group. Uh, this is January 1995. They were Overall, very few people on the registry is less than a million people uh, as compared to today. There are like 23 million people. And what he said was the previous year, there was less than 1% of uh, African-Americans or Blacks who found a marrow match. So it was like 2,000 people, less than 20 Blacks found a match and the rest of them did not have a good outcome. So I was dealing with that. You know, I went into shock and you, when you hear these uh, prognosis, sure. you hear that type of prognosis, I, I went into shock. I heard this thumping sound in the background. You know, it was kind of loud. And I was wondering what that sound was. And I, I looked to the side and I saw that uh, there was a big army clock behind me, one of those big wall clocks. The second hand was just ticking away. That was my reaction to the news. And, and the doctor was giving me more information, but uh, I would hear part of it and then drift out and think about stuff like, you know, my five-year-old daughter and how old she would be, you know, in three years. She would only be eight years old, and I was trying to make it, like, more. Yeah, devastating. I was trying to think, like, 10 years or 15, but <laughs> kept coming back to eight. So I felt like I had a bad lottery ticket, and I got some second opinions. I went up to Walter Reed Medical Center in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and they gave me the same, same diagnosis, same prognosis. So, you know, eventually I, I accepted that, that it was what it was. And uh, during that time, I also found out that uh, my sister uh, did not match me for a bone marrow match and no one on the registry matched me at all. Mm. Uh, so I decided that I wanted to do bone marrow drives. At first it was recommended that I not do the drives, uh, but I felt that I could get better results with uh, me out in the um, community doing the drives so people could relate to me and interact. Mm -hmm. So I started doing drives, uh, both with the military and civilian drives in churches and the malls, colleges, 
anywhere where I could find people, get a crowd together. And uh, as far as the military, I went around to the different military posts in different uh, states. And uh, I also had friends who did drives, like in Hawaii, Germany. We did drive at the uh, Pentagon, and we, we were like thousands and thousands of people on the registry over a good period of time, but I still couldn't find a match. Wow. So, Mel, I listened to you talk about these drives, and it's just wonderful. You were trying to find a way <laughs> to, one, keep busy, but also find a solution. And I think I would have done the same thing. So tell us what happened after that. I kept doing the drives, and eventually I had to take a medical retirement from the military because I, I could not continue with my military duties. That was about maybe a year into my diagnosis. I moved down to Atlanta, Georgia, to be close to my wife's family in case uh, the prognosis was right, then she would be closer to her family. Sure. And then I kept doing the drives. I kept doing the bone marrow drives. My wife's aunt was also doing drives in down in Columbus, Georgia. I went down and we did some television promotions and print interviews and things of that sort. And the next day I went to the drive and a guy who had hairy cell leukemia, uh, he had came to the drive and he was looking for me. He was a businessman. And he said he had been out to MD Anderson and they did a um, clinical trial or some experimental medicine. And then he said he was near death and now he was completely fine. And he looked completely fine too. Wow. Yeah. So right now at that time, I was 18 months into my diagnosis. And I, I kept talking with him, gave me the information to contact his doctor, who was a, a blood cancer doctor. It was at MD Anderson in, in Houston, Texas. And I called the doctor once I got home. And the doctor and his nurse picked up the phone at the same time, uh, which was really unusual. Sure. And I told him what my diagnosis was and what I was doing. I was taking a drug called interferon. I was injecting myself every day in my stomach or in my thigh. And this doctor happened to be the doctor who actually did the clinical trials for interferon. He was one of the best doctors in the world. So he said, come on out to MD Anderson and we'll see what we could do. So I flew out to MD Anderson and he looked at my records and he said, well, yeah, we still have some time. I'm going to increase your dose of interferon. I'm going to try to do some other drugs and we're going to do clinical trial after clinical trial and, and see what happens. So that was my first introduction to clinical trials. Wow. So had you not been doing that drive that day? meeting that person, we may not be recording right now. That's right. In fact, <laughs> uh, that was 1996, so that was 26 years ago. And if that guy had not come to the drive, then, yeah, like you said, I would not be doing this interview. And I, I talked to him uh, just a few months ago, and he's still doing fine. Terrific. So tell us about the clinical trial, Mel. Well, the doctor increased my interferon. That did not help much. And I started doing different combinations of drugs and they would work for a minute and then it would stop. And then I start doing clinical trials and some of the clinical trials were not to extend my, my life, but to help with my quality of life. For example, there was a drug, pegylated interferon. I did that for a while. And the difference between that type of interferon and the other type was that I could just take one shot a week versus a shot every day. That helped because I you had to keep the interferon refrigerated. You know, if you traveled, that was a big inconvenience. But in the interferon, that type of interferon, the PEG interferon, did not work very long. So I would start doing other stuff. And eventually I got to the three-year mark that the doctor had talked about. And I was pretty much in the same place I was when I started, I was still alive, but uh, I was still in the same place where I started. And in fact, I would sleep for like eight hours a day. And then I would wake up and I felt like I had not been to sleep at all. I uh, you know, drink mm. coffee. Coffee's not helping. It was a different type of fatigue. Sure. 
I asked the doctor, was there anything else? Did he have any more drugs? And he said, well, we have this one drug that we're working on. It's close, but we're having problems in the lab with the animals. But when we get approval, uh, you'll be the first person to use it. I said, well, you just told the other gentleman the same thing. Yeah, he was going to be the first to use it. So the doctor said, well, yeah, you'll be the second person to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was, I was glad to hear that because it was only 20 people who could be on the trial uh, at ND Anderson. So I, I went back home around July. The doctor called and said they got approval to use this experimental drug, which is Gleevec. So I flew back out. And I was the second person to use the drug at MD Anderson. And it worked for me. It did not work for the first guy. Of course, the dose was very low because they were testing to see if it was safe. That was the main thing that they were testing for. They knew that it would have some efficacy, but they didn't know at what dose. And it worked for me at a very low dose. And then some others who came on after me, it had not started to kick in for them. But when they got to higher doses, it started working for everybody. So uh, that was good. Wow. So what did this mean for you? I could see that the medicine was going to work. And I had to stay out at ND Anderson for, for three months. That was part of the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was happening today, it will not be as long, you know, because they could do a lot of stuff remotely. And during that time, I, I had to travel back and forth. So it was a lot of travel. Uh, but it saved my life. And about uh, 10 months after I started the trial, in June of 1999, I ran a 26.2 mile marathon in Anchorage, Alaska. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so I went from being barely able to walk around the block to run in the marathon in, in, in 10 months. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So now share with everyone what this meant in regards to the bone marrow transplant route. Okay, so... For CML, the standard of treatment changed because when I was diagnosed, there was only one option, really, if you wanted to live a long time, and that was the bone marrow transplant. Uh, but after doing the clinical trial, the standard treatment became Gleevec, which was this pill that you take once a day. Uh, it's a big difference between a bone marrow transplant and one little pill uh, that you oh, just yeah. take it every day. <laughs> so I really couldn't believe that it was happening because for all that time, my mind was set on this bone marrow transplant. People could not believe that they did not need a bone marrow transplant. And it's much better because with a bone marrow transplant, there could be complications such as graft versus host disease. However, the technology for a bone marrow transplant has greatly improved since 1995. When I was doing the drives, people had to give blood samples. And now all they have to do is give like a little cheek swab. Uh -huh. They don't even have to be on site. They can just do that through the mail. It's all free. So that's a big advance in technology. Absolutely. But the Gleevec is really just unbelievable. As I understand it, there are other disease states too and other conditions that Gleevec has helped, not just, you know, your diagnosis and other blood cancers. Do you know much about that? Uh, yes. You know, very soon after Gleevec came out, Gleevec was the first drug of its type where it targeted the protein of um, CML, the thing that caused the cancer cells to proliferate. So it went there and it turned off that protein. It inhibited that protein. And the type of drug that Gleevec is, it's a kinase inhibitor. So it completely shut that down. And then folks were saying, well, if it turned off it here, it could work in other different types of cancer who have that same protein. And, uh, you know, very soon they start doing clinical trials on stomach cancer. Uh, it works for, for GIST, for gastro intestinal stomach tumors and uh, you know, that's the standard of treatment for, for just and then they just for Gleevec it started working for like maybe it was over 10 different cancers wow yeah and then with that same theory mm -hmm. it could work for like Lyme cancer and breast cancers all these different types of cancers I, I, I believe there's like right now there have been over 70 FDA approved drugs which use that uh, same kinase inhibitor, and it, it's helped 
over a million people. And just for Cleveland alone, it's helped like three to 400,000 people. And I know there's been clinical trials on it with dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes. There, there's clinical trials even for COVID. Really? They were seeing if Gleevec could work with COVID. And yeah, hey, it's so Oh, that, wow. I was glad to take my Gleevec. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what the results of that was, but yeah. uh, it probably had some effect. So it works, it works for so much. So Mel, I'm going to put you on the spot. What would you say to someone that is just scared or on the fence, just your clinical trial elevator speech. What I would say to someone who, who is on the fence about a clinical trial is that there's so much involved in the clinical trial because I started at phase one. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it depends on when you diagnose or, or when you want to come in. You can come in at phase two, you can come in at phase three, and there's very little risk at phase three because a lot of the risk had already been you know, smoothed out at phase one. True. And uh, a lot of people were trying to come on Gleevec in phase two, and there was not enough of the drug. So they had to jump through hoops to, to make enough of the drug to accommodate everybody. The drug was really accelerated, the approval of the drug, because they could see that it was working. But still, from the time that I started the drug until it was approved, it was like three years. I started in August of 1998, but the drug was not approved until May of 2001. So if you got like 20,000 people diagnosed, a very small portion of them are actually getting that advanced technology. So if you want to go in there and get a drug that works and get it early and get it in time, a clinical trial will give you that opportunity because... Uh, for example, I was diagnosed in 1995, and I was given three years to live, but I did not start the drug Gleevec until August of 1998. And if I would have had to wait until the drug was approved, then... Who knows? That would have been much too late. I would not be here. So you were seriously in the right place at the right time. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was credit really, really, really close. For clinical trials... It's getting so much easier these days. And if you join, you can stop at any time that you want. So it's a good option. I will recommend that when folks are first diagnosed to maybe inquire about a clinical trial. They may have a treatment and it works, but to also just do some research and see what can help. Because it could be an option down the road. Uh-huh. So you never know. But just find out more about clinical trials. That's great advice, Mel. And, and that's what we hope to provide for everyone out there, you know, mm-hmm. advocate for yourself and understand what your options are. And very important point that you could stop at any time. So, you know, there's nothing to lose, at least getting started and everything to gain possibly. Another big thing is the patients are not always asked to participate, to be a part of clinical trials. So if patients are asked to be a part of a clinical trial, then there will be a lot more people on clinical trials. But if they're not asked up front, it just gets away and it doesn't become important until whatever therapy they may have does not work. And then that might be when they think of a clinical trial. But clinical trials also improve your quality of life. And for any drug that's in your medicine cabinet, a clinical trial has been conducted. Everything that is a prescription medication has to be approved by the FDA and has to go through the clinical trial process. Good point. Well, Mel, I also want to thank you. We know how important it is to get the word out. And if I were you, I would love to think that you've saved a few other lives along the way with your bone marrow drives. I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. We had very big drives. One drive, they had over 10,000 people. When I participated in drives, it was always a big team of people. Like my first drive was at work. And 342 of my coworkers joined mm. on the registry. On the other drives, they would have like set up the table and, you know, the coordination and the punch table and the cookie table. You know, <laughs> I had like high school kids, you know, they were doing that. So it's like one big team. And also the people who work for the Merrill organizations, they, they are a huge part of the drives too. And especially people who join like, for example, one of my best Army buddies, he, he joined the registry. He was not a match for me, but he was a match for somebody else. 
and I was able to go up on the day that he donated Merle to see the process. Oh, that's neat. That was back in 1990. Actually, 1995. That was the really the first year. Right in the beginning. That, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that must have been something. I saw that it was working. You know, people find the matches. Oh, for sure. Uh, I think the number, yeah, for every 430 people that join, one life is saved. You saw it. I still stay involved with it because you never forget how it feels when you need a donor and you really have no control over finding the donor. You have to depend on the good will of somebody else. You know, you have to depend on how they feel that day. And it's out of your control, really, uh, except for getting out there and, and asking people. Sure. Well, I'm thinking of the soldier and you coming out. Yes. That your boots on the ground, get the job done, save lives, your civil duty. I mean, you are quite an incredible man. Oh, thank you. We are so thankful to you for everything you've done and what you've done for millions of people. And and the timing of it all, I just can't get over that. So, Mel, I think we're going to wrap things up. I want to know, how old is your daughter today? Okay. Well, she was five when I was diagnosed, and she's, I believe, 32 now. Oh. Yeah, she went on and uh, finished uh, high school, and she, well, she went to Harvard. Oh, wow. And did psychology pre-med, and then she came down here to Atlanta, went to Emory Medical School, and she went back up to... Harvard for a residency, and then she came back down here to work as a psychiatrist at Emory here. So, oh wow, it's a good story. I'm I'm glad I was able to see it. You must be so proud, and yeah, we're so thankful that you're here. Yeah, because I w- I would have missed all that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it would even turn out the same. Well, and you wonder how much your experience influenced her with you know the career she chose, seeing you go through all that. Yeah, you know, because we took her, her name is Patrice, and we took Patrice to all the drives that we could, you know, because she was still in school. So we took her to all the drives, and she was able to see, you know, see the blood and, and see the, you know, people sticking, like, needles in the arm. But, you know, they don't, they don't do that anymore. They just do the cheek swap. Yeah. But she was able to see that. And one, one time she said, hey, Daddy, I don't see why you can't find a match. All, all the blood looks the same to me. So she was she was full of her <laughs> <laughs> scientific <laughs> theories back then. So, uh, yeah, I, I think all that did. Too bad she's not right about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, in fact, a lot of people don't understand that. Yes. Uh, well, Mel, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Peggy. I would also like to thank the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link for the opportunity to educate people about clinical trials. Yeah, this has been tremendous. And it really, this has been just a great season to produce. And getting to have someone like you that's gone through such a monumental trial, we really appreciate your time and your inspiration. Oh, thank you. This has been the Marrow Masters Podcast. If you know someone who would benefit from the information in our show, please share this episode with them via text, email, or social media. Don't miss an episode of our show. Follow the Marrow Masters Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. To connect with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, visit nbmtlink.org or follow the link in our show notes. The Marrow Masters Podcast is produced by Jag and Detroit Podcasts.